Hi everyone, I'm Scott Rosen, and I'm being videotaped, not used to, actually that happens from time to time. I'm very used to speaking in public and speaking in front of groups because I'm a trial lawyer. Among the things that I do as a commercial litigation lawyer, there's a lot of disputes that involve real estate. So I'm hoping that I can bring some things up today and take you through some ideas that maybe will help in the different areas. We've got investors, we've got agents, we've got architects, we've got mortgage people here. Entire agreement clause, check this out, and it's in the standard form. It's in, going to be in virtually every real estate agreement standard. The entire agreement clause has some magic words in it. It says, by and large, this agreement is the entire agreement between the parties. And anything you discuss that's not on this paper is not part of the deal. Anything else that was promised is not part of the deal. Anything that's not written down and signed here is not part of the deal. Any previous paper is not part of the deal. The professionals in the room, you have to be very careful to do it right. You don't want to goof and, and cause a problem for your client. And for the investors, you have to make sure you read it. The, the, don't just listen to the agent, read it, be careful, read it 10 times. You know, I, I've been doing, I've been practicing law for 25 years and sometimes I'll read something 10 times and then change what, how I interpret it. After, once I keep looking at it, I say, no, it doesn't mean this, it means something else. And, and be careful. It, it's, it's boring, it's tedious to really read that stuff carefully, but it can be so important. And you guys talk about location, location, location. We talk about language, language, language. <laughs> when there's a problem, when there's a problem and it ends up in front of a judge, uh, the, the, the agent who prepared the agreement or when it's some other kind of commercial agreement, the lawyers who drew the agreement and maybe they spent hours, days, weeks, months making an agreement where they're trying to anticipate all the things that could happen down the road. Then something completely unexpected happens, a big fight starts, uh, I get hired on one side or the other, and two years later you're fighting about what the words in this contract mean. The, what the judge looks at, if they look at anything at all, but that's a different story, but what the judge looks at, if you're lucky, is they look at the words in the agreement. They don't want to hear from anybody at, when you're in court, they don't want to hear from any of the people involved what, the, what they say it means at that point. I was just dealing with someone who had a potential case. Uh, he imports seafood, this, this gentleman, imports seafood on some big ship and it was frozen and the stuff didn't stay frozen properly and it got ruined. Does he have a claim? Well, he sent me the back of the bill of lading. I couldn't, even with a magnifying glass, I couldn't read it. I went on the, in I said, it's got to be, I went on the internet, I searched the name of the company and the bill of lading, and they had the full text of their bill of lading. And when you printed it out in regular size letters, that one page became 17 pages. It became 17 pages, and I went through it and I started highlighting all the ways they told him he was screwed. Page after page of you have no rights and we can we can take the stuff you're shipping and we can basically throw it in the ocean and you have no rights and if it's food we can eat it and you have no rights and oh and then it said by the way if you'd like to sue us you don't have it's not a two year claim they said it's one year in their contract and that's allowed so now you only have one year and by the way it said if you'd like to sue us you have to sue us where our head office is in Israel. Anyone heard the phrase in terms of dealing with real estate that someone's ready, willing, and able to close? Those magic words, ready, willing, and able? Well, there's one. So that's a legal concept, very, very old law. The idea is that time's of the essence. So you have a deal, someone's buying this building for a million bucks, and it's supposed to close uh, right now at eight o'clock today. And the seller has a lawyer and the buyer has a lawyer and you have to show that you're ready, willing and able to close. So a buyer, how, is a bu how does a buyer show he's, he or she is ready? They show they have money and documents. A seller has documents and, and keys. Really a, a seller has to have good title, clear title to give. So let's look at it this way. Here's where the problem occurs. If the buyer has all the money lined up and all the documents and the mortgage, the buyer's in good shape. The same, by the same token, if the seller has all the paperwork's ready, there's no title problems, 
Well, then everybody's ready, and what happens? The deal closes. The deal closes, the buyer now owns the property, the seller has the money, and everybody's happy. But when someone's not ready, that's when it eventually lands on my desk. So, anticipatory breach. The buyer, let us say, knows. It's two weeks before closing, they know they can't get a mortgage. They just, they can't find institutional money, they can't find private money. If the buyer knows that they just can't do it, sometimes their lawyer tells them, look, let's just try to work something up. Maybe we can get part of your deposit back. They write to the seller, send a letter, look, my client is not going to be able to close. Let's try, can we work something out? They try to work something, they usually don't, but they try. That's an anticipatory breach. It's an early breach. They're not waiting until the deadline. They are just, they're telling ahead of time, I'm not going to be able to do this. By the same token, I've seen many times, especially when the market was going up, up crazy a few years ago, where sellers would simply take the position, I'm not selling to you. I am not closing this deal with you. Sue me. Well, that's an anticipatory breach. So it's a breach ahead of time. There is, it's, it's been mostly knocked down by the courts, but there is an old remedy of specific performance that still, that still exists for buyers if your property is unique. So normally, let me take this back to law school 101. The remedy for a breach of contract usually is damages, right? Somebody, you get wrongfully terminated from your job, you get damages. Uh, all kinds of breaches of contract, you get damages. If somebody is doing a renovation at your house and, and they breach the contract because they don't do the work properly, they agreed to build this room for $50,000, they don't do it, they make a big mess, you have to hire somebody else, it costs 100000 to fix it, you sue them for damages. That's the remedy for breach. But specific performance exists because, it still exists, because real estate is special, right? And we're all here because real estate is special. And going all the way back to old England, if you were buying a piece of land, you could force the seller to complete the deal and sell to you. So if I'm buying a property from you, I'm buying a property from you, and you decide for whatever reason, oh, let's turn it around, you're buying from me. And, and you're buying my building, this building from me for a million dollars. I now own your building, I'm just saying. So for a million bucks or whatever it is. And I change my mind. What are you going to do? You get your deposit back. I wouldn't be able to keep your deposit. I'd say, take, take, get your deposit back. I'm not closing with you. If it's a rising market, your remedy is damages. If I have said to you, I don't want to sell to you anymore because I think I can sell to that lady for $1.5 million, well, you just lost the ability to sell it. What are your damages? Probably a half a million dollars. So you've got, a, you've got an action, a lawsuit for damages. Latent and patent defects. So you're buying this building. You look around, you see this, you see that. You have an engineer or a home inspector come, check it out. Maybe you don't find all the problems. The, the seller has no obligation to say anything. They don't have to tell you anything. It's up to you as the buyer and your lawyer to go and check the title, right? They have to give you good title on closing. They can't force bad title on you. But you have to go check the title and see what, see what the issues are, easements and all these different possible title issues. You gotta have a good lawyer to check all that out. And the physical building that you're buying, I mean, if you're just buying land, it's, it can be, can be easier, and you have environmental issues, but the, the by and large, the seller doesn't have to say a word. You're buying it as is, so go look. Go look, satisfy yourself. Take pictures, take video, bring in your inspectors, whatever you want to do. If it's something that was visible, that was something that was discoverable, that's a patent defect, and you're stuck with it. If it's a latent defect, I guess at one point in, in, in time, urea formaldehyde would have been an example of a latent defect. So now there's a, a UFI clause in the standard agreement because everybody, other, everybody put it in the agreement anyway, so they made it a part of the standard agreement. The idea is it's some toxic stuff that was in, could be in the walls. You, wouldn't know, you would not know it was there, but the seller 
might know. So if there is something that is a, de a known defect to the that the seller knows about that is important, they don't tell you, but there was no way for you to discover it. It may be a latent defect. There might be, it might lead to be, being able to win and get damages. But if you've got a leaky basement and it's because there's a crack in the foundation that could have been, I'm thinking back to a house that I bought once, a, a crack in the foundation that somebody could have gone and looked and said, look, there's a crack in the bricks and there's a crack in the foundation. You probably have a leaky basement. You have no recourse. You're buying it as is like a used car. A lot of people here want to build, they want to flip, they want to be developers. So this is actually some, I think some important stuff. So think of the construction process as a pyramid, because that's how we think of it, the construction pyramid. And at the top you have a lender, maybe it's you as owner or it's a bank or whatever. You've got a lender, then you've got an owner, then you've got a general contractor who hires some subs, who, who hires more subs and each level is getting, getting wider all the way down to the you know, individual trades. You can appreciate that the owner's at the top and there's lots of smaller entities further down. That's why it looks like a pyramid. So the Construction Act, it was for generations called the Construction Lean Act. And I, I keep wanting to say the lean word. Um, the, it's just been changed. It's the Construction Act now says that every time a dollar flows, just two things about the money. One is that every dollar that flows down is trust money. So let's say you, sir, your company, you're the flooring guy and you are hired by the general contractor. So you're one level below the general contractor. So you, maybe you hire people below you too. Okay, not employees, but other companies. So every dollar, so you send a bill to the general and money flows down and money, and he, the general pays you, you got money from the general. That money is deemed to be trust money. You hold it in trust. Who do you hold it in trust for? You hold it in trust for anyone beneath you that you've hired on this project. And in theory, you're even supposed to have a separate bank account, but in reality, nobody in the world does that. So you hold that money in trust. In the real world, unfortunately, no one observes this law, but they really should. So if you are somewhere in the middle of that chain, you're the mechanical contractor and you've hired a plumber beneath you and you've hired an HVAC company beneath you and, and you've gotten money the, uh, as the mechanical contractor, you've gotten money from the general above you and the people beneath you don't get paid because you took the money and you kept it for yourself. You went on vacation, or you paid your rent, whatever, anything but paying the people beneath you. That company, that mechanical contractor that got money from above and didn't flow it all down, they're in breach of trust. And they can get sued by the people that they owe, meaning in, in this example, the HVAC contractor and the plumber, they can get sued, not only their company, but they can get personally sued, the owners of the company, the directors, because it's deemed to be, to be a breach of trust. So all that money flows down. That tr that's a very important concept. It's all trust money. The Planning Act for this purpose essentially says as follows. If I bought this piece of land right here, and then, and I put it in my own name, and then I bought the one over there, the next one. It's right next door, and I put it in my name. I now own two, and they're next to each other. If I then decided, now that I own these two, that I'm gonna sell this one to you and, and that one to you, I can't. Because since I own these two and they're next to each other, the law, the planning act says they've merged. They're essentially one. Now, if I, I bought them separately, but they've merged. If I wanted to sell them separately, now I gotta go to the city and I gotta go through, and I'm gonna have a whole, I'm gonna need all kinds of experts and professionals in the committee of adjustments and do our applications and see if they'll sever it again. Now, but if I incorporated two new companies, A company and B company, and this one bought A, comp A company bought here and B company bought there, well, now it's perfectly fine. But that's what the Planning Act says. To answer your question, you can sue them. Well, if they can spell your name, yes, they can sue you, but maybe they'll win, maybe they won't, and who's going to spend money on it?